Well, happy Easter to each of you. Let me add my welcome to uh, the ones that have already been given. I'm glad to see you here today. It's a great day. Of course, every Sunday that we worship together is a great day, but especially when we come together on Easter Sunday, the day that uh, sets the tone for us every other week of the year. Really glad that you're here. I always get, I always find that you get a little more amped up for Easter than than other Sundays. I don't know why. I mean, why why shouldn't we be excited about Easter? Uh, today is the day that we celebrate the turning point of all of history. Today we celebrate that Jesus has conquered death, risen from the dead, and secured heaven for his followers. Uh, and I feel like today. Of all messages, this message that has come together is super relevant for you. Sometimes people tell me after a message that, uh, you know, they, they come up to me and say, you know, that, that message really felt like it was for me. And I get what, I get what they mean. Uh, they felt like there are lots of ways that it applied to their lives. Well, today, today I can genuinely say that this message is for you. I don't know about you, but when I go to church, I like it when a sermon is for me but not about me. <laughs> I don't want the main point of the message to be something like, you know, be kind to awkward people, and then after the service, I know a bunch of people come up and say hi to me. Uh, that's not what I'm hoping for, a message about me. But I do like it when I hear a message that is for me. Today, I can genuinely say that this message is for you. Before we are done, done we will cover three ways Jesus' sacrifice was one of a kind, and with each way, I will demonstrate that it is also uniquely for you. We gathered here just a few days ago, uh, Thursday night. We had a communion service and we commemorated the Last Supper of Jesus, kind of anticipating today the resurrection. And at one point in the evening, I announced, He is risen. One guy in our congregation, I don't see him here this morning, one guy he kind of looked confused. I wasn't sure why. Afterwards, he told me he misheard me and thought I said, he's in prison. <laughs> that would be a very different message, right? He's not here, he's in prison. Of course, that was the very misunderstanding that the disciples had on that first Easter weekend. After spending pretty much every day with Jesus for three years, suddenly Jesus was arrested, taken away in the middle of the night, and as far as they could tell, game over. Where's Jesus? He's not here. He's in prison. In fact, by Saturday morning, he got even worse. If someone asked them then, they would have tragically said, he's not here. He's buried in a tomb. And that brings up something that I'd like to consider this morning. The Easter story includes a small but surprisingly important detail. It's hardly ever mentioned when we talk about the Easter story, something that seems at first to be kind of minor until you look more deeply into it and realize just how significant it is. And all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them take the time to mention this interesting story behind the tomb that Jesus was buried in. Why is that? I mean, just to put it in perspective, only two of the Gospels mention the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, the Christmas story, but all of them mention how a rich guy provided his own tomb for Jesus. And here's what we know when we weave all four of the Gospel accounts together. In every account, right after Jesus was crucified, an otherwise unknown character comes into the spotlight. A wealthy man named Joseph from the town of Arimathea. And what's fascinating about him is that he is also a member of the Jewish council that condemned Jesus. He, in fact, was the only dissenting vote. He did not agree with their decision to condemn Jesus. You see, secretly, we are told, he believed. But he didn't tell them that, only that he thought that Jesus was innocent, only that he thought, in his opinion, Jesus shouldn't be condemned. Now, Joseph had also paid for a family tomb to be hewn out of rock, a cave excavated out of the side of a hill, a tomb big enough for his entire family. It would be his final resting place for himself as well as his future generations. But all of that is the backstory. As I said, after Jesus died, 
the spotlight shines on Joseph. Because of his status in the community, he, he goes to the governor, Pilate, and requests permission to have the body of Jesus. Pilate consents. Joseph takes Jesus off of the cross. It is no small task. He had to recruit help. A guy named Nicodemus, that's, that's a whole other story. They rig a ladder and pull his body away from the wood and lower it gently to the ground. They then carry the body to the tomb that had been meant for Joseph's family. Back then when someone died, it was the custom of the family members to close the eyes and kiss the cheek before the burial. Without any family around, they did their best to honor his remains. They washed his body, anointed it with oil and spices, and wrapped it in white linen. No doubt they closed his eyes, kissed his cheek, and placed Jesus into the tomb, and rolled a stone across the doorway to seal it. As they looked out to the horizon, the sun was setting, the Sabbath had begun. Again, all four of the Gospels tell the story, the story behind the tomb that Jesus was buried in. And when we look more deeply into that tomb, we discover three ways that Jesus' death was unique. First of all, we are told that the tomb of Jesus was new. In a couple different places, the Bible describes the tomb of Jesus that way. Unused by anyone else, the tomb of Jesus was new. For example, in John, we read this. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. It was a new tomb never used before, and maybe, maybe before I continue, I should pause to say just how remarkable it is that Jesus was buried in a tomb at all. I mean, the Bible says that during his lifetime, Jesus had no place to rest his head. He certainly didn't have money to purchase a tomb. But even more than that, he was a crucified criminal. And criminals back then were often buried in unmarked mass graves. It's amazing that Jesus had a tomb at all, much less a brand new one, not yet used. That his tomb was new was unusual because back then people used family tombs, which they reused over and over again for many generations. Hardly anyone back then was buried in a new tomb. So what is significant about the fact that Jesus was buried in a new tomb, unused by anyone else? Well, it reminds us that Jesus' death was unlike any other. God was doing a new thing in Jesus. Jesus' death was no common death, and his burial place was just as unique as his sacrifice. And his death would be unlike any other. Just as Jesus was laid to rest in a tomb that no one had ever, been, had ever occupied, so too he died a death which no one else could ever die. A sacrificial death for the sins of humanity. That Jesus' tomb was new reminds us that Jesus' death was unlike any other. But there's another reason it's important that Jesus' tomb was new. It served to validate the resurrection. I mean, think about it as if you were a first century criminal investigator. If it was a communal grave, there could have been remains from others who had been buried there. When Jesus rose, people could say the grave was still occupied. With a new grave, there could be no doubt in anyone's mind about the identity of the one who arose. It was necessary for evidence for his resurrection. The new tomb served to validate that he was risen. But as I promised at the beginning of this message, uh, this message is for you. And if you think about it, for some of you, the tomb is new for you as well. Maybe it's a point of history that you've never ever really considered, the uniqueness of Jesus' death. Maybe you can honestly say, it's, honestly say it's the first time you're really thinking about that tomb. It's new for you. I will add this, for all of us, it should be new and fresh. 
no matter how many Easter's you've celebrated, something vibrant and alive and new and vital for us to consider the tomb that Jesus died in. Jesus' death was new because it was unlike any other death and verified by an unambiguous resurrection. Secondly, the gospel makes a point to tell us that the tomb of Jesus was borrowed. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. For example, in Matthew, we read this. It says, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. The tomb was not Jesus's. It was borrowed. There's a uh, fictional story that I kind of like about, about Joseph of Arimathea. The legend goes like this. It says, as Christianity grew over the years, Joseph became sort of a, a celebrity among uh, those around him. Everyone who met him was super impressed that he gave up his own family tomb for Jesus. Whenever he, where, whenever he met other Christians, they would gush about his selfless generosity. But Joseph would, would simply shrug his shoulders and always say this. He says it wasn't a big deal. After all, he only needed it for a weekend. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. So what is the significance that Jesus' tomb was borrowed, belonging to someone else? Well, first of all, it shows Jesus' humility. Humility. Jesus traveled without a home throughout his ministry, and even in his death, he had no tomb of his own. Certainly, we would expect the Son of God to have a proper burial place. Instead, in keeping with his humility, he was laid to rest in a borrowed tomb. But even more than that, being buried, buried in a borrowed tomb fulfills Old Testament prophecy about the coming Messiah. The Old Testament predicted this, that that he would be assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. I wonder, I wonder if Joseph had any idea that as he was moved to give his burial plot to Jesus, I wonder if he had any idea he was fulfilling a prophecy made hundreds of years before he was born. Being buried in a borrowed tomb fulfills Old Testament prophecy. But maybe, maybe mostly I want you to see this. Being buried in a borrowed tomb reminds us that Jesus died for others. Jesus did not die for his own sins, but for the sins of others. It was evident when he died without sin on a criminal's cross, but it was even, even also evident when he was buried, not in his own grave, but the grave of another. I'll tell you this. We, we don't know anything about Joseph after the resurrection, but I bet he had a killer testimony. Jesus died for my sins and took them to my grave. What a testimony. For us as well. We need to see that Jesus borrowed our grave as well. He took our place. He took our place on the cross, and he took our place in the grave. The scriptures promised it, and he fulfilled it. Jesus' death was one of a kind because he, he not only took our place on the cross, he also took our place in a borrowed tomb. Now, there's literally dozens of other ways I could describe the tomb of Jesus from the Easter story. Along the way, it would become an occupied tomb, a guarded tomb, a secured tomb, an angel visited tomb, a place of sadness, a place of joy, a place of alarm, and a place of curiosity. It would become all of those things. But the most important thing that needs to be said, the thing that, that sets aside the tomb of Jesus from all other grave sites, the third way Jesus' death was unique, the tomb of Jesus is empty. In the Gospel of Mark, the angel at the tomb says this, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. 
The astounding message of Easter is that the tomb of Jesus is empty. And even though Jesus only occupied it for a couple days, ever since it has remained empty. Jo Joseph never used it. The tomb he created and carved out for his family. Instead, it became the cornerstone of a movement, the place where people ever since have wondered and worshipped. So what is the significance that Jesus' tomb is empty? Well, first of all, it fulfills Jesus' own prediction. Jesus' uh, resurrection is all the more, more remarkable because Jesus predicted it. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus predicted that the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. The resurrection of Jesus is all the more remarkable because Jesus predicted it. It was always God's plan that the tomb would be empty. But the empty tomb is also significant because it induces faith. John, the author of the fourth gospel, not only wrote about the resurrection, he experienced it. In John 20, verse 8, he referred to himself there as the other disciple. And this is how he described what happened. He says, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. And putting it that way, John reveals the impact that the empty tomb can have. The empty tomb induces faith. Back in 1981, some bones of Buddha were discovered. They had been a gift to an emperor of China during the Tang Dynasty, but they had been lost. But then they rediscovered them. But the remarkable thing about the Christian faith, unique from all others, is that our faith is grounded in the reality that there are no bones to discover. The tomb is empty. It is the remarkable message of Easter. For us, for us, the empty tomb of Easter should spark faith. It fosters faith. It assures us that there is more for us too beyond the grave. And if you put your faith in Jesus and his sacrifice for you, you too will have the promise of risen life beyond the grave. So I don't know if you've ever put it all together, but one of the chief ways that we realize Jesus' death was one of a kind is because of the uniqueness of his tomb. It was new. It was borrowed. It was empty. And it still is. And for us, for us, Jesus' sacrifice was new, unlike any other death, because he took our place on the cross and he took our place in a borrowed tomb. And because that tomb is empty, even today, it fosters faith and assures us that we too can live forever. Father God, of all Sundays, we celebrate so much today because of the reality that you are alive today. And we're very aware, I'm very aware that even as I say these words, and even as we pray to you, you're right here in our midst. You are here, you are at work in the lives of those gathered. And we thank you, Lord, for your ongoing work in this world and even in our lives. And I pray for any today who are, are here today but have never put their faith in you, uh, have never made that decision to follow you. I pray that today might be that day. And if that's you and the Spirit of God is tugging on your heart, you can simply silently pray, Lord Jesus, Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and rising from the grave. And let me walk with you now the rest of my life. And for each of us, may the newness and the wonder of your resurrection not be lost on us. May we marvel and wonder and worship today because you are alive and you are here 
you walk with us. And one day, we will see you face to face with the promise that we will live together with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.